Hills building. One of which I mentioned in the last hour, which is um, you, you may find yourself a, in, in a need to know situation. And if you have enough of the book, <laughs> um, if you find yourself in a, in a situation where you have a need to know, and you have enough vocabulary and sort of some concepts and ideas, you can teach yourself stuff real quickly. Right? My 47-year-old son, um, in 2014, uh, called me with the sad news that his wife was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. Um, and of course, you know, he's smart, she's smart, they figured out real fast, this is a lethal tumor, this is going to kill you, um, and at best you got 15 months. Um, <clears throat> he was also clever enough to say, you know, we, we've got three kids to take care of, I've got a job i got to go to, and I need someone who can comb the literature and find out where the research protocols are being done, which ones we, we ought to try to get into. And that's you, Dad. I knew absolutely nothing about glioblastoma. I knew absolutely nothing about, well, I knew enough. I had, I had what I call cocktail party knowledge. We well, walk into a cocktail party and everyone else is a lawyer. We can talk about all kinds of osteoblast shit. <laughs> and they think you're smart. I had cocktail type knowledge about uh, immunotherapy, but I didn't know anything about it, really. So I went to the, went to the NIH website and pulled up osteosarcoma, I mean, uh, glioblastoma. It's wonderfully organized, and I started looking at protocols. And of course, I would read the protocol and what they were trying to do, and I, knew, I didn't know the science. So I would go to my other computer sitting on the desk and go to the internet and study the biology. And, uh, you know, when you have a real need to know, like whether it's an exam day after tomorrow or whether someone's really bad, sick, that you want to do something for, you can learn pretty quick. Well, there was a, there was a remarkable study being done at Duke called the polio virus study. And you may have seen this on 60 Minutes, um, or you may have read it last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. Their first report was in the New England Journal of Medicine last week. They, there was a guy at Duke who was a microbiologist who said, I think if we could modify the polio virus such that we could inject it into a person and not cause polio, but leave the antigens present so that T cells would attack it, we might be able to create enough inflammation to kill the tumor. It's a, it's a robust, weird idea, right? It's a weird idea. We're going to create a firestorm. We're going to create a firestorm that we hope will kill the tumor. Well, he spent 20 years modifying the polio virus so that he could inject it into a person and not cause polio, but create an immune response. It took him so long, and people didn't believe in him so much that microbiology, micro department at Duke refused to give him tenure. And so he went to neurosurgery and sold them on the idea, and they gave him tenure and kept him around. Um, probably about, uh, I don't know, 2000 or 2001, he got the virus to where he wanted it, and he got the FDA to approve putting it in a human. So they put the word out, we're looking for a glioblastoma. It turns out there was a sophomore female at Duke University who developed a glioblastoma, and it was sitting out here on the front of the skull, up here on the front of the brain. And she agreed to do it, so they put her to sleep, cut a hole in her skull, injected this polio virus into the tumor. Now, <clears throat> that was 2000, 2001, I don't know when it was. Maybe it was on, I don't know what it was. She's alive today. She's cured. She's she cured a little bit so much. And what happened was they injected this this uh, polio virus into the tumor, took a needle and just shot it in there. Dendritic cells 
that are just flowing around in our body all the time, recognized it as a foreign protein, gobbled it up, right? Digested it into proteins and into DNA and RNA, and then attracted T cells and fed them to the T cells. The T cells made receptors and B cells made antibodies and the immune system went to work on this foreign protein. And it created a firestorm. It created such an inflammatory firestorm, it killed the tumor cells. Now, how it killed them all, I don't know. I mean, I don't get it, but it killed them all. She's alive today. As you probably remember when you studied glioblastoma, it's a tumor that, that grows out along the, 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 the neural cells in, in, in the body, so it's so hard, so hard to kill. So I called um, Duke and um, asked to talk with Dr. Friedman, and he was, of course, too busy to talk to me. But his secretary said, no, where are you? I said, I'm in Oklahoma City. She said, well, he's going to be in Oklahoma City Wednesday. This was like Monday afternoon. He's going to be in Oklahoma City Wednesday giving a talk. I said, you know where he's staying? She said, yeah, at the Ambassador Hotel on 10th Street. I said, you think I could have dinner with him? And she said, I bet you could. So I had dinner with Dr. Friedman, who's the oncologist that is running this study, and told him the story about my daughter-in-law. And he was nice and kind and listened carefully. He said, really, all I need is her MRI which I just happened to have. <laughs> he said, I'll take this back to Durham and I'll look at it with the neurosurgeon and we'll decide if she meets the criteria for getting in the study. Now you can imagine that you have a tumor inside the brain, inside the skull. Where this tumor is that you're going to create a firestorm with matters. This girl, this young lady from, it was a sophomore at Duke, hers was way out peripherally, sitting out over here in the frontal and parietal lobe, sitting right out here, okay? Jill's, my daughter-in-law's, was way down deep by the fourth ventricle. It was sitting down by the thalamus. It was sitting down there where all the stuff is, right? Not just the piano lessons and calculus, but the stuff. And so she didn't qualify. They could get a needle down there and they could create a firestorm, but she didn't qualify because they had tried a couple of tumors down that deep and they killed the patients. The firestorm was so big it killed the thalamus, it killed the hypothalamus, and blah, blah, blah. So she didn't get on it. But <clears throat> I began to learn a lot about which, which, um, molecules are these uh, researchers looking at to try to make to try to make an antibody to that would attract uh, the, attract those those tumor cells kill them and the, all the tumors today all the tumors that are responding to therapy are being are responding to these immunotherapies immunotherapies I've got a good friend I ride bikes with that's uh, 72 years old, and he um, has um, uh, mild, mild blastic leukemia and um, myelogenous, chronic, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And he called me and said, God, I got this diagnosis, CML. And I said, Oh, you got a Philadelphia chromosome. He said, Yeah. I said, Man, that's the one to have. That's the one to have. There's a brand new drug out that puts almost everybody in remission. Doesn't kill it, that doesn't make it go away. But Puts almost everyone in the mission. That was two and a half years ago, and he's riding his bike every weekend. He's doing well. So most of these are immunotherapies. You can, if you have to, mostly you won't have to, but if you have to, you can teach yourself enough to walk around the walk around this jungle. My, my daughter-in-law, just to finish the story, got on two, two trials um, uh, against certain proteins in this in this field last one. And she she responded to both of them. I mean she she the tumor went away on MRI twice. Always came back, but it went away. Um, 
The other thing I learned that I didn't quite understand at the time is that these tumors are smart and they're biologically efficient and they're as, they're as good at becoming resistant to the drug as bacteria are at becoming resistant to the antibiotics. And uh, especially these very aggressive tumors, they'll, they'll, they, they develop uh, resistance. So my daughter-in-law walked, talked, uh, had full function uh, for, for two, two years, uh, two, almost 26 months. Uh, and then when she, re when she relapsed in the s to the second experimental drug, she went into a coma and died within about uh, eight days. Which is a damn good response to, uh, to that kind of a tumor. Well, we're not talking about tumors, we're talking about rheumatologic diseases, but what we're going to talk about a lot with these rheumatologic diseases are these monoclonal antibodies, these what are called biologics. And uh, Latassi is going to wear you out um, with the drugs. Um, yeah, it's, it's something. I mean, I, I can't even sit in here. It's, 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 it's too much torture for me. And all my slides just say, uh, see Latassi's <laughs> going to talk to you a lot about these monoclonal antibodies because they are also responding to specific receptors in immunologic diseases. Okay? Right. Objectives. Hope that you will be able to differentiate the etiologies of various connective tissue diseases, but mostly autoimmune diseases. Relate laboratory testing to the various autoimmune diseases and develop a differential diagnosis based on presenting complaints. Now, nowhere in medicine is it more important than it is in rheumatologic diseases to take a damn good history. Because what you're going to see here in a minute is that physical findings and laboratory tests overlap so much that almost never is the laboratory test diagnostic. So what you have to do is take a very, very detailed, robust story from the patient. Do a very careful exam, like uh, Professor Rohr was talking about this morning, and then um, kind of put that all together, maybe go back to the textbooks a little bit and read about some of these diseases. You'll have after taking the history, you'll have three, maybe four diseases you think this might be based on the clinical story and the physical exam. And then you'll try to figure out what's the best test to, um, to order in this situation. I handed out some, some uh, handouts there. One of them is about autoimmune antibodies uh, that, that occur in various diseases. I'm going to try really hard in this lecture today and the one on on Thursday to emphasize which antibodies you need to worry about, which diseases. But there's only one or two instances in which they are by and large diagnostic. They're mostly all overlapping. Do you have any extra handouts? I think I have one or two. Did anyone else miss it? Trying to, you're trying to figure out, is this, is, is this an inflammatory disease or is this a non-inflammatory disease? And they'll all say, boy, when I get up in the morning, I'm stiff. Okay. Now, I can tell you, as far as I know, I don't have one of these diseases. And when I get up in the morning, I'm so damn stiff that if you saw me walk to the bathroom, you'd think, my God, he's 107. <laughs> It's pitiful. It's pitiful. 
My wife won't even wake up when I get up. She just keeps her head. I don't want to see it. I don't have one of these diseases. So aging makes you stiff. But aging makes you, uh, gives you musculoskeletal pain. Goes away. By the time I'm through peeing, I'm pretty much walking to get my cereal. Okay, but I still don't look like I'm 19. Those days are gone. Oh, this, I didn't get the, I didn't get the right set of slides. This is all screwed up. Inflammatory, inflammatory arthritis has morning stiffness that lasts usually in 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 general greater than 60 minutes. Non-inflammatory, less than 30 minutes. So there again, how how long before you can get going? You know, well, like I just told you, I get going by the time I get to the bathroom and get you know get through with that business. I can pretty much I'm, I'm okay. So that's maybe you know how big my prostate is, anywhere from 45 seconds to six or seven minutes. And didn't get, and I know it didn't get small. <laughs> Synovial fluid in joints that are inflamed have um, greater than 2,000 cells per microliter. And non-inflammatory joints that might have fluid in them, generally between 200 and 2,000. Again, these numbers are not diagnostic, but they sort of help you with a range. The number to remember is 2,000. Less than or greater than. Um, other other tests you all have already studied the ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the CRP. These are tests that just sort of they're sort of a general screen for does the body have something inflammatory going on in it, right? They're not specific for any disease, but they're. They kind of help you decide, is this an inflammatory or non-inflammatory arthritis? So here's a list of the, of the diseases that we'll cover today and Thursday. Um, there's the finishing of the list. Okay, <clears throat> I went through and modified these slides, and I got the old slide deck sent to me. So there'll be some uh, spelling errors. These are, again, Cimarron County ways of spelling words. Um, who knows what's wrong with you? There'll be a lot of problems. I got pathology? Huh? How about that word? Pathophysiology. <laughs> what the hell that word? That's supposed to be path pathophysiology. Yeah, well, it is. It's Cimarron County pathophysiology. Okay? Rheumatoid arthritis affects about 1% of the population. Um, if your relatives, first degree relatives, have it, you have an increased risk. Um, most people think her heritability is about 60%. We don't know, we don't know what causes room to arthritis. It's like so many of these illnesses, probably it's a setup by your genetics in some way. Your genetics are built such that if you get an infection or get exposed to a certain molecule, you have a high incidence of your immune system responding to it by giving you rheumatoid arthritis. We just don't know what we don't know what the antigen is, and we don't <clears throat> we don't know exactly how that works. My guess would be that within your practice lifetime, at least half of the diseases we'll cover today and Thursday, we will find out. No, it's not we. Those guys, those women out there, will find out what those antigens are and will know how to start immunizing or something to prevent us from getting these diseases. Um, for pants, HLA DRB1. For some reason, these testing sites like these HLA things, I would, I would memorize that HLA DRB1 correlates with rheumatoid arthritis. That's not a diagnostic test, but it's a correlate with, that's one of the things that correlates with families. <clears throat> I 
The American College of Rheumatology criteria for making the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is on page two of the handout. Now, if you'll just glance at that handout and realize why I'm not going to go over that. If I, if I were you, I would not memorize this, okay? I would remember where I put it so that next year when you take a history and you and, and you think, this patient sure could have rheumatoid arthritis, you either pull it out or go to the ACR website and pull it out so that you can decide, you know, do they have enough of the criteria. These are all, all these diseases are kind of like syndromes. And so the, um, the experts around the world meet at conferences and make up these rules about what does it take to make the diagnosis. There was, there was a change in, in frequency of pap smears when I was a, a medical resident. This had been in the late 70s. All that came out was big news. Yo, you know, you got to have pap smear every 12 months if you're blah, 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 blah. So I was in a meeting, I don't know, 12 months later, and some expert who had been in the room making this rule said, you know how this got made? We've been meeting for three days, going over all the literature, and about half the people in the room had a plane to catch. And everyone was so upset that we couldn't make an agreement, so we just stood up and said, let's vote. And then we were all practicing. So these aren't rules that came down off of some mountain. Ten in number. These are a bunch of people sitting around voting. Okay? So keep up to date. Keep, keep this list. And if you think the patient might have rheumatoid arthritis, look at it. Autoantibodies and rheumatic diseases. Look at it. page one. Page one has all the antibodies listed there. And it has, um, has, the, has the antibodies, has the diseases, it has what percentage of people might have it in that disease. And as you start looking at those numbers, um, you start seeing how much overlap there is. Okay. Rheumatoid arthritis is by and large a symmetrical, small, and large joint arthritis. So if their hands are involved, it'll probably be both hands. They might have a single large joint, like a hip or a knee or an elbow that is um, not symmetrical. But if they have it in their small joints, their, their feet or their hands, it ought to be symmetrical. If someone comes in complaining that they have bilaterally symmetrical small joints, that it gets swollen and tender and stiff. You got to think of rheumatoid arthritis. The skin is involved. Rheumatoid nodules commonly present on areas where there's pressure, like on your elbows. <clears throat> Pyoderma gangrenosum is common. There's a picture of Pyoderma gangrenosum. It looks like it sounds, doesn't it? It's a big, ulcerated, grungy looking lesion of the skin, and it's, it's an autoimmune lesion. Rheumatoid vasculitis is common in people who have rheumatoid arthritis, especially if it isn't treated early. <clears throat> eyes, keratoconjunctivitis seca. Keratoconjunctivitis seca means dry eyes. So it's like like people with Sjogren's syndrome who have dry eyes. Episcleritis. Episcleritis is of the sclera. Epi is the outside, so it's a redness and, and plain sclera. You may sometimes just see the vessels in the sclera. And in pulmonary, you can see exudative pleural effusions, but here's the thing to remember. Rheumatoid diseases, if they cause lung disease, almost always cause interstitial lung disease. Do you remember 
interstitial lung disease from pulmonary? It's not COPD. It's the disease of the interstitium. It's not the disease of the alveolus. The lungs become stiff. Okay? If you don't remember interstitial lung disease, you might review it just a little bit. But for this module, what you're going to remember is that if you have a rheumatologic disease that affects the lungs, it's almost always going to be interstitial. It doesn't matter which one it is. Cardiac. People with rheumatoid arthritis have a higher incidence of coronary artery disease, congestive health, health, congestive heart failure because of the coronary disease, and pericarditis. How do you diagnose pericarditis? Remember that? Chest pain. A friction rub. Right. Put your stethoscope on the on the heart and you hear a and it, you might at first think, oh, that's a, that's a murmur. But the more you pay attention to it, the more you realize it doesn't really sound like a murmur. And it can be triphasic in, um, in uh, <laughs> and murmurs never do. Um, Felty syndrome. Felty syndrome is when someone has rheumatoid arthritis, low platelet count, low no, 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 low white cell count, and splenomegaly. Mostly it's rheumatoid arthritis and splenomegaly. We don't know why there's splenomegaly. Or at least I don't. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Treatment? Pay attention to the testing. Okay. Osteoarthritis. Okay. Yeah, I just funded that one, huh? Dropped back 10 pounds. Okay. Osteoarthritis. It's the most common form of arthritis. It's really, really common. Its prevalence gets larger with age. Slightly more common in men. For the pathophysiology, Stephen Addis lecture. That was last month. That's last time. Remember that? Yeah, well, you go back and read that. I'm punting all over. Sometimes I'm punting to myself. Okay, so primary is when there are no pre predisposing factors. Someone just comes in, they don't remember injuring their, their joint, their, their hip just started hurting. That's pro probably the most common. Grandpa just started limping and he just says, well, my hip just hurts. Doctor tells me it's bone on bone. So the pain may be intermittent or occur uh, or occur with joint use. It's uh, usually asymmetrical, so it's not a symmetrical disease. It's one that's called oligoarthritic. Usually one or two large joints, or one or two small joints. The small jo the the first joint of the thumb, the first joint of the of the index finger are really common in osteoarthritis. Here we go again, Hebridine and Bouchard nodes. The Hebridine nodes are the ones in the distal joint, and the Bouchards are in the middle. Okay? And they are <coughs> nodules that are sitting up on top of the joint. They're um, nearly pathognomonic. They're nearly pathognomonic, meaning if they have them, if they have Heberdine's nodes or Bouchard's nodes, they have osteoarthritis. I say nearly because there aren't very many sure things in those. And Baker's cyst is in the popliteal fossa. So what you do is when you're examining, they might say, I got something behind my knee. Or they may, it may be asymptomatic. And when you're examining, their musculoskeletal system, and you put your hands around their knee, you'll feel it in the popliteal fossa, and it's just a big old bag of water back there. There are no laboratories that are specific to osteoarthritis, so none of the, none of the blood tests help. Even, even ESR uh, can be mildly elevated. So, Osteoarthritis is thought of as a non-inflammatory arthritis. On the other hand, if you've got bone on bone, you're going to get some inflammation. 
And so your ESR might be a little elevated if people are having a flare. I don't know why it is, but people with osteoarthritis get better and get worse and get better and get worse for reasons we don't understand. On x-ray, you see narrowing of the joint spaces and subchondral sclerosis, okay? Now, this is one of those diseases that you mostly only need plain x-rays. You don't really need CT scans and MRIs to make this diagnosis. Here's another image of uh, the knee. Different x-ray than I had before. But you can see there's no joint space. Joint space narrowing. Really bright bone on either side. Now, have you had someone talk to you about x-rays? Mm -hmm. Told you there are only three densities on x-ray. Okay. You can see all three of them here, right? Air. Black. The mineral is really, really dense white, and water is a little bit less dense. Those are the three. And this is mostly metal. This is mostly calcium phosphate. So basically, this is an illness where insects work, and there's not much else that will work. Now, has anyone talked to you about these insects? Has Latassi said that all these insects cause heart attacks? All except one. Which one of the insects has been, has never been shown to increase the likelihood of having a heart attack? Naproxen. Naproxen. I, I, this is, this is a, Pretty clear fact. I don't know why it's going on. I don't know why it's going unnoticed. I can't figure out why ibuprofen sells a pill. I mean, if I want to use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent, it's always naproxen. It's always a leave over the counter. Take two every 12 hours. It's easier to take, um, and. Never been shown, although tested numerous times, never been shown to increase heart attacks. Now, here's another thing. Glucosamine and chondroit, chondroitin sulfate are common chemicals that people are selling out there to give people to treat their arthritis and to prevent arthritis. While early on there was some excitement, which is not uncommon, when the N in the studies is too low. Further studies have shown, later trials show that this is not much benefit. Doesn't matter if you're eating it in pills or injecting it in joints, it doesn't really seem to do much. And patients will go out and buy it by the gallons because they get on the internet and find these, these places that are selling it saying it's good for your arthritis. Occasionally, injection of a steroid can be beneficial. I would never make that uh, diagnosis, or I would never make that decision myself. Um, I would only allow, um, in my practice, I would only allow an orthopedic surgeon uh, to make that call. I, I'm not gonna make it. And then, of course, joint replacement is the most, a very popular way to treat that. Fibromyalgia. The American College of Rheumatology um, has some fibromyalgia uh, criteria, and they're the old ones are gone. There used to be a there used to be a point tenderness thing that they had pictures of, and you look at it and go, "Oh my God, it's going to take me an hour and a half to push on all those points." Now there's only 19 places where you have to hurt. Um, in their new criteria. It's a pretty uncommon, 0.06 to 10%. That's a pretty wide range. Yeah? There's a lot of practitioners out there who don't believe this exists. Okay. Here's what I think about fibromyalgia. I think it's like um, anxiety was when I was a resident. We didn't know what to call anxiety disorders because they didn't exist. We 
would examine these people, they were more commonly women than men, but, but, but there were lots of both. So, what's wrong with this guy? Well, I don't know. I, he's just kind of a nervous Nelly. He, he's just worried about everything. He's worries about stuff he shouldn't be worried about. He's just a nervous guy. And I had a I had an attending that was just way before his, he was wise beyond his years, way before his time. He would look at me and say, Vanetta, sometimes I gotta use Valium. This patient has a Valium deficiency. And I go, oh yeah, a Valium deficiency, sure. Well, 10 years later, gamma immune gamma immunobutyric acid was discovered. Found out that that's a receptor in the brain that when down-regulated makes you nervous. And when up-regulated makes you calm. And in normal circumstances, your GABA works normally. When you have a generalized anxiety disorder, it is down-regulated like crazy. And it, and you're a nervous nothing. There are two things that make you well. One are benzodiazepines, and one is alcohol. So it wasn't uncommon early in my career to see people come in with alcoholism that were self-medicating their anxiety disorder. It worked. God, I take two beers and I feel totally normal. The only problem is it's addictive. I take one of those benzodiazepine tablets and I feel normal. The only problem is it's addicting. Dr. Gunn was right. Some people have a valium deficiency. They're called chronic anxiety disorder. They have a deficiency of a benzodiazepine. There are no natural benzodiazepines that downregulate these receptors. I think fibromyalgia is going to be in that same category. We don't know what's causing this, but it's a real disease. It's causing havoc in people who have it. And sometime in your practice lifetime, we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure out what it is, probably figure out some treatments for it. Um, and then we'll figure out whether it's really 0.06 or 10%. It'll be somewhere in those ranges. A lot of misunderstanding. A lot of people don't think it exists. And a large number of practitioners, therefore, want to ignore this. You'll see some of your preceptors come out of a room rolling their eyes and say, oh, geez, I don't want to deal with that. They'll try to get them out of their practice. They just don't want to deal with it. It's, they're really, really hard patients to deal with. <clears throat> Studies suggest that the pain state of fibromyalgia is mediated by aberrant chronic pain reflex. Now, we all know that the pain reflexes are in the dorsal ganglia of the spinal cord. Um, but what we know about, about fibromyalgia patients is that they respond to these, to these pain receptors, both peripherally and at the spinal cord level, much more sensitively than, than normal people do. There are some studies that show that uh, there are uh, neurotransmitters that are elevated, like glutamate and substance P. I left the P out of this slide. I put it in that one I fixed, but I didn't get the one I fixed. So it's substance P, not substance in the <laughs> Oh, I didn't put I didn't put Latassi on this slide. I put that's because she's gonna ignore it. I'm betting she isn't gonna cover it. I'll probably be wrong. She covers about everyone. Um, there are lots of things that can be done uh, encouraging people to exercise uh, in, in randomized control trials shows help. It's nearly impossible because these people are so fatigued and they're so painful that they, it hurts to exercise. So they have to fight through it. But exercise works. Use of PT helps. Um, PT physical therapists are a good place to send these people because they have protocols to help these people uh, get to move 
And dual serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors have been shown in some cases to help. There's no question in my, in my opinion that validation makes a big difference. To tell these people, mostly women, I think it's an eight to one uh, ratio to women and men, to tell these people that they have a real problem is helpful. At least validates their, their experience. Their experience has been that doctors don't like them and doctors won't listen to them and doctors ignore them. Brian and I think we may have seen a patient that might have fibromyalgia last week in the um, Good Shepherd Clinic. Okay, spondyloarthritis. Here's another HLA number that you need to memorize. If you have any test question in pants about ankylosing spondylitis, it'll be which of the HLA antigens is associated. That's HLA B27. And that's been known for 30 years. So everybody asks it on the exams. Ankylosing spondylitis um, is not sufficient to make the diagnosis. Um, it, these are people who present with low back pain. Um, if they're having a flare when you see them, they'll have pain right on the, um, the line of Ischium, the ischium, and it'll be spot tenderness. And then you can x ray them and find some sclerosis along those lines. Uh, it's three to one in men over women. They have insidious low back pain. Stiffness is worse after rest and better with use. Um, so it's a, a little unusual. Bilateral buttocks pain is common. Uh, and it correlates, this buttocks pain correlates with the sacroiliac. Run along the sacroiliac joint. Okay. <clears throat> X-rays of both sacroiliac joints is is helpful. Again, the X-rays are not diagnostic. They're sometimes normal. B20, B, HLA B27 is not diagnostic. Sometimes helpful, but it's mostly the story. You know, it's a it's a middle-aged man who's got really bad low back pain. Doesn't even lift for a living, you know, he's a, he's a general internist minding his own business and uh, not doing much heavy lifting or a lawyer or accountant or something. Okay, another spondyloarthritis is psoriatic arthritis. Um, psoriatic arthritis um, occurs in 15 to 20 percent of people with psoriasis. So just because you have psoriasis of the skin does not mean you're going to get arthritis. Only less than 30% get an arthritis. But the arthritis is severe when you get it. Just, it's, it's a little bit like rheumatoid arthritis in that it destroys joints. Rheumatoid arthritis. The problem with rheumatoid arthritis is it'll destroy your joints and you won't get them back. Psoriatic arthritis, if you don't control the disease, will destroy your joints and you won't get them back. Dac dactylitis, that's diffuse swelling over the joints, tendons, or ligaments, present about 50%. And it's inflammatory in nature, but the antibodies uh, do not help in the diagnosis. So finding antibodies is not very good in this diagnosis. Mostly, you look for the psoriasis and you look for onchalysis of the fingernails. Fingernails, it's hard for me to describe what it is. Onchalysis, you can, you can Google it and it'll show you some pictures. Sometimes you'll have pitting. Finger pitting is lesions of the, of the distal, of the ends of their fingers, little pits on the skin. Now, five or 10% will be positive for those antibodies that are present in rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> the thing that I didn't point out, uh, has anyone got, the, got that antibody thing sitting in front of you? Can you look at CCP for rheumatoid arthritis? What's the sensitivity and specificity? 
CCP for rheumatoid arthritis? 70% sensitivity. What? 70% sensitivity. What's it, how about specificity? It just says more specific than RF. Oh, more specific in RF? Than RF. Oh, than the rheumatoid factor. Well, these people can have an RF, a rheumatoid factor, or a CCP. We didn't talk about this when I was talking about uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but the CCP is the best um, is the best antibody for rheumatoid arthritis. You'll want to do both the rheumatoid factor and the CCP with rheumatoid arthritis, but the CCP is more sensitive. I'll, I'll, I'll get to this when we talk about shirts. Okay, here's onchalysis. I thought I didn't have a picture of it. See those fingernails? <coughs> oh, they're trashed. They're just trashed fingernails. And um, that's a pretty good sign that someone has psoriatic, psoriatic, psoriatic arthritis. You know, that their arthritis is due to psoriasis. And then the third one is inflammatory bowel disease associated arthritis. So this used to be called reactive arthritis. Um, it was called reactive arthritis because it was always found in people with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's or, or um, um, also colitis, who then wind up with an inflammatory arthritis. Okay? Um, sometimes it's seen with urethritis too. So they might come in having had a flare up of inflammatory bowel disease, have pain on urination, and um, have, this, have this inflammatory arthritis. No specific lab tests are available to diagnose these spondyloarthritis. Um, so you're left, with, um, you're left with the clinical presentation. With ankylosing spondylitis, remember that the pain is here in the sacroiliac joints. The sacroiliac joints might be inflamed on x-ray. <laughs> With psoriatic arthritis, you want to look for psoriasis. You want to look for the hand findings. And for reactive arthritis, you want to get a history of having had episodes of <coughs> Crohn's or uh, ulcerative colitis. I think reactive uh, arthritis <coughs> has also been described now in infectious uh, bowel diseases like Yersinia, E. coli. Um, Yersinia is probably the most common. <coughs> Again, NSAIDs is the mainstay of therapy. Um, glucocorticoid injections and DMARDs can be helpful. TNF alpha receptor inhibitors can be recept can be helpful, especially in people who don't respond to insects. All of these diseases are on such a spectrum from so mild it doesn't really bother me very much to crippling arthritis that you have to watch the the clinical phases of the disease and decide how aggressive to get with treatment. <clears throat> so we're going to start with SLE next week, or I mean Tuesday. And we'll probably be an hour to an hour and a half on Thursday to get through these slides. Any questions? I think I've um, emphasized the things mostly that will be on this exam next Monday. Okay.